So previously we were working on the shear and moment diagrams, but before we could continue on with that, I need to go over distributed loading. So up until this point, we've been seeing dealing with problems with concentrated loads at specified locations. But what if you have a distributed loading scenario? Let's go ahead and draw an example out. So let's say we have this beam with the appropriate supports of dimension L. We have um, on the horizontal, we have the X axis and on the vertical, let's call it the W axis. And this here is a distributed load. So it's a load that's basically placed across the entire surface of the beam. And so it's distributed along the surface of the beam. Let's call the loading, um, a function of W with respect to X. So the force, depending on what location with respect to the X is going to be changing based off the function W of X. And so this is the main difference when it comes to previously we've been dealing with concentrated loads at specific locations. Now in this case with distributed loading, just like we've always done, it's always trying to come up with a simplified version of our situation. So in this case, there is actually a way to simplify this distributed loading such that you're able to come up with a resultant force, FR, that's some distance along with respect to point zero. And we'll be calling this distance X bar. So instead of dealing with a distributed load, we actually simplify it, come up with a resultant force, FR. And we also saw for the location that this will have the same result as a distributed load just for simplification and then we use a resultant force to go ahead and use our static equilibrium equations to solve for the necessary reactions and so forth so here are the equations the resultant force is equal to the integral with respect to the length of the beam of wx d X. So this is how you solve. If we happen to have the function for this distributed loading, we just take the integral of it, which essentially is just the area under this curve, right? Going back to calculus. So this would be our resultant force equation if we happen to know the distributed loading known function with respect to X. And our X bar is equal to this formula, the integral um, over the length of the beam. Um, x times that function wx dx divided by the integral of wx dx. And this is how you're able to solve for the equivalent resultant force and the location with respect to the um, point O such that you're able to represent the distributed loading as a concentrated load that would have the equal effects of it. Now, for the most part, when it comes to analyzing certain problems, there are certain shapes that are very common, such as we have this first scenario here, which is basically a constant distributed load. And then we have this other one, which is a linear distributed load. It increases as, as you go along the beam. Now, what's very beneficial when it comes to these common um, distributed loads that we see is um, when it comes to finding the resultant force, it's just the integral of this, right? The area under this curve. So essentially, we just find the area of a rectangle here. So it's going to be, let's say this is L, and let's say this is, um, let's actually put numbers here. So let's say for this case, we have the 10 newtons um, per meter. So for every meter, there's 10 newtons being distributed along the surface, and we have this length 5 meters. So what would be the area of this distributed load of this rectangle? So it's going to be, so the area of a rectangle is equal to the base times its height. So we just do the 5 meters multiplied the 10 newtons per meter, which essentially gives us 50 newtons. So this is the resultant force, because remember, it's that integral or the area below that curve. So the resultant force is equivalent to 50 newtons. Now for x bar, since we're dealing with these common distributed loads, it's going to be right at the center of this rectangle. This is where you're going to, going to apply the resultant force, which essentially is just half of the entire length. So it's going to be 2.5 meters. So that's one common, but what about this other distributed load? Let's say at the very top of this triangle, then there's 10 newtons 
per meter being applied. Of course, there's a linear relationship, so it changes along this x. And let's also say this is 5 meters. So what's the area below this curve or the integral to find the resultant force? Well, we know the area of a triangle, which is 1 half base times height. So that gives us 1 half times your base is 5 meters. Your height is going to be this distributed load, 10 times 10 newton per meter then we just saw for the resultant force which is 25 newtons now when it comes to x bar for this common distributed load the x is always now for your x bar when it comes to a triangular distributed load it's always going to be one third time of your length in this case it'll be five meters l so the resultant force will be located here from the top part of this triangle to the location will be one third of the length. So these are the common distributed loads that you see and you don't necessarily have to be using the equations that you saw previously. And you could just use the area of a triangle, area of a rectangle. And when it comes to a rectangle, the, the centroid is gonna be half of your length. But for the centroid of the triangle, it's going to be one third of the length where you're going to be applying that resultant force that you just solved for. Let's go ahead and do some examples. All right, so for this problem statement, we have replace the loading by an equivalent resultant force and specify its location on the beam measured from point B. So we have point A and point B, the respective supports, the dimensions as well. This is 12 feet, 9 feet. And this is where we have this kind of distributed loading. At the very top, we have 800 pound per feet. And right here at the final bottom portion of it, we have 500 pound per feet that's being distributed along the beam. Now, we, since we already know the areas for triangles and rectangles in this case, we actually could split it up into its respective geometries. For instance, we have this triangle on the left-hand side um, with respect to B, but on the right-hand side, we actually have a rectangle and on top of that rectangle, we have a triangle. So the first step is to try to simplify it to make it easier to solve for the resultant force. Now, once you're able to d identify each um, geometry within this distributed loading, um, you're actually able to solve for each resultant force of each um geometry that you just drew. So for instance, for this triangle here, we're going to have one resultant force. Let's call this F1, only accounting for this distributed loading. Now for this small triangle, we're going to have another resultant force. Let's call this one F2. And then for the rectangle here, we're going to have another resultant force. Let's just draw it right here. F3. Now, the problem statement is find a resultant force for all the distributed loading. So, I'm just going to draw it out before solving for it. But our resultant force, considering the forces 1, 2, 3, I would say the resultant force would be around here F, R, and from point B to this location would be R, X, Bar. So that's what we're trying to solve for in this problem. The resultant force um, and the, the location with respect to point B from all this distributed loading. So now let's go ahead and solve for F1. Since we already know the area under this curve is the area of a triangle, one half base times height. We have the height of 800 pound per feet being applied and we have the base being 12 feet in length. So F1, we have the one half times the base being 12 feet times your height being the distributed load, we see that feet cancels out and we, we're left with the force in pounds, 4,800 pounds. This is your equivalent force of this distributed loading. Now let's go ahead and solve for F2. So again, the area under a curve, one half base times height and one half the base is nine feet in length here for f2 now the height that's one thing you have to be careful of you see at, that it ends at 500 pound per feet and the height is 800 so the height of this triangle is only going to be 
this portion of this. It will be 800 pound per feet. Take away 500 pound per feet. This will give you this height of 300 pound per feet. So that's what we're going to be using for our height here to solve for F2. So F2 is 1350 pounds, the equivalent for that area, for that distributed loading. So F3 is equal to the length times width, which is the area of a rectangle, which is 9 feet times 500 pound per feet, since this is the height of this rectangle. So it gives us 4,500 pounds. So now that we have these um, forces, one thing we also need to find is the location with respect to B here for each of these forces, F1, F2, F3. Now, when it comes to a triangle, it's based, It's very simple from the high point of the triangle to where the resultant force will be located is one-third of the length. So it's going to be right here, one-third times 12 feet. And here is going to be one-third times nine feet here. And F3 is just going to be half of this rectangle, which is basically going to be only 4.5 feet. So let's go ahead and just write everything down here. Now just keep in mind, the X bars are with respect to the, when it comes to triangles, with respect to the highest point, the height of the triangle, so one third. And this also one third, and the rectangle will be half. So. Just keep track with respect to what location is this X bar in reference to just to make sure you know the exact location of it and you won't get confused. So now knowing the forces as well as each of their um, locations for these equivalent forces for each of these distributed loadings that we actually divided up into simpler geometries to solve for the areas. Now we need to solve for the resultant force. So what force will be equivalent to these three forces here, F1, F2, F3, as well as what location? So find the resultant force as well as the location that will be equivalent to having these three resultant forces distributed along these portions. So this is where we apply the sum of moments with respect to point B specifically because that's what we're being asked to from respect to point B what will be the location of this resultant force so the resultant force is very simple it's going to be the addition of these three forces right going downwards all going down FR is equal to the F1 plus F2 and F3 so find the resultant force for all those three forces pretty simple you just add them up because they're all going downwards. Now when it comes to finding the x bar of r, this is where we do the sum of moments with respect to this resultant force fr. So what are the moments that is being caused by fr? And this is being equal to the sum of moments with respect to b. Now one thing to keep in mind, both of these moments are with respect to b. Only the difference is we're trying to find what what moment does the resultant force cause that's equal to the moment of each individual forces F1, F2, F3 that we solved for. So let's go ahead and do that. So the moment that's being caused by the resultant force, we see it's going to be a... Um, clockwise direction so it's negative so it's 10,650 pounds since we do not know the location with respect to point B then we just put x bar in this case x bar r which is what we're trying to solve and this is equivalent to the sum of moments with respect to point B of these forces f1 f2 as well as f3 so this is equal to the 4800 pounds times the perpendicular length which is four feet take away 1350 times three feet take away 4500 times four and a half feet and then you solve for x bar r so it's just algebra here and we solve which gives us 0.48 feet this is the location of this resultant force so that basically going back to the problem we had this distributed load we essentially simplified it and solved for an equivalent resultant force fr that we solved and the appropriate location x 
bar. And the reason why you would want to simplify this is once you're dealing with the concentrated load and you have the spe specific points, you're able to solve for the reactionary forces of these um, locations. And that's why it's it's always good to know how to simplify distributed loading into a concentrated load and know its specific location.